So welcome everybody to this AWSRG, Australian Wildlife Sound Recording Group seminar. And uh, my name is Andrew Skiak. I'm the president of this August little association. And uh, this evening, we're going to be talking about a subject that really fascinates me, uh, field craft. But uh, to begin, I'd like to acknowledge country and uh, that all of us live on country, uh, wherever we are in the world, met much of it originally owned by indigenous people who've never ceded their custodianship of it. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge, uh, I'm joining you from Jajarun country in Southeast Australia, and I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging and the wisdom with which they've custodianed the land and lived within its means for many tens of thousands of years. So this evening we're going to have uh, a slightly different format. Uh, rather than a presentation with a capital P, we're going to have a discussion uh, in which I'd invite all of you to um, be involved and contribute to. Uh, Roger Boughton has been uh, a member of this AWSRG community for a long time and a very uh, involved member of the UK WSRS, the Wildlife Sound Recording Society. He's been a field recordist for nearly half a century. Sorry, Roger. <laughs> So he has a lot of experience and uh, he's going to be sharing some of that with us this evening, I hope. Um, and it's, you know, field craft is a subject that really fascinates me. It's not something that really um, gets a lot of discussion. We talk about equipment a lot. Um, and, but the actual, you know, field craft I think of as being what happens when you've got your gear, got your recorder, you've got your microphones perhaps, You've got some time scheduled to go out into the field and have a muck around. What happens next? What do you do with your equipment? So to discuss this, I'm going to invite Roger to take over. And um, I will, as I said, we'll, we'll make this more of a discussion. So Roger has invited your, um, your comments and questions. Uh, there's nothing off limits here. Things that you've, you would like to ask uh, and either Roger or some of the, the others of us on this session, we can, we can have a chat about it. Um, so to do that, either put a comment in the chat and I'll, I'll moderate those and pass the questions through to Roger or um, simply unmute your mic at an opportune moment and, uh, and ask away. So with that, Roger, um, yes, the floor is yours. <laughs> right, well, um, welcome everybody. Uh, this is the um, first time I've ever done one of these, so um, I'm not going to be that slick. Uh, so I need all your help in uh, me uh, finding the answers to your questions, which I hope will be many. Uh, I'm talking to you uh, from a very cold, damp and dark northern england lancashire uh as i look out of the window i can't see a damn thing because it's still too dark um but uh it's uh, uh i know it's quite warm where you are in australia and um and uh yes i wish i was there again i've been lucky enough to uh, be a member of this um, the australian group uh, for nearly 20 years um and uh, I've been to a few of their biennial seminars, which if, if, if any of you have never been to them, you're missing out on a great deal. It, they're great fun uh, and you learn a lot. Yes, uh, even old fogies like me that have been doing it for a long, long time. Um, yeah, so... Um, we're here to talk about field craft. Uh, field craft is, and I'm going to uh, apologize because I have written notes and I'm, I need to look at them every now and then. So please uh, 
please uh, sympathise with me there. Um, we're going to look at uh, Fieldcraft, but the question I wrote down for myself was, what use is Fieldcraft anyway? You know, why bother? Why make such an effort? And because to do certain things in in wildlife sound recording, it there is a it can be quite a bother. Uh, what are the benefits? Why do it? Does it really let you make better recordings? I I would like I I think I have to say here that whatever wildlife sound recording you do, you will always benefit from applying field craft. And um, I, I'm going to I'm going to bring in I'm going to share this uh, screen just to try to allow Andrew, if I may. There's a share screen, and I'm going to play this. I have to say here that we've been trying to get things to come through on stereo, but I only can get things to come through on mono. But that recording, in fact, was done mono. And it's um, it's it's the kind of recording that I don't want to make. It's it's a, a recording of a roe deer, and it's alarming at me. It's because I've stumbled into its territory without thinking, and it's shouting at me to say, you know, you know what the hell goes on? Anybody can make an alarm, a recording of an alarm call, but if you use field craft, you can, you can do much better. And I will, this is the same animal. Um, that in fact is the same animal. It's a roe deer, uh, but and but that are those are the uh, territorial calls, and um, uh, I purposely got myself in an area where uh, I knew there were roe deer. I, I didn't quite realise there were that many roe deer. To be honest, I was sitting. Uh, I found myself crept in um, just before dusk and uh, position myself under a, a lump of rock and hid myself away and uh, I wish that was stereo because there's about five or six roe deer shouting each other saying this is my territory it's not your territory I, you know, I shouldn't anthropomorphize like that but that's what they were doing they were they're having a shout at each other and it wasn't an alarm that was a territorial territorial call Anyway, I shall drop out a share and um, and we'll carry on. Uh, so, any any wildlife sound recorders, in my opinion, should apply field craft. Uh, if you've got questions right from start now, please please let me have them. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of field recording you do. Um, I'm I'm. Um, I'm a, a recordist which likes to record the vocabulary of species. That means I have to um, concentrate on a, a particular animal and try and get as close to it as possible without disturbing it. 
I also have this um, masochistic um, um, way of doing it, which, uh, well, it, it came very early on, and there are various reasons why, is that I, I, I feel that to get the best recordings, you have to do it with an open microphone. Uh, not a parabolic reflector because of the faults of par parabolas, but um, I so I had to get an open microphone close enough to the subject without disturbing it, and uh, and do a recording, which takes a bit of effort. It takes a lot of time. Oh, can I define field craft? Uh, yeah, I suppose so. But I, what I can do is I'll, I'll, I've written a definition here for myself. It's a definition of field craft success. So, um, which I think will answer your question. Uh, it's the ability to enter into and depart from any natural environment stroke habitat without or with minimal disturbance to the animals within that environment and habitat. And why are there hence, therefore, to be able to freely observe in our particular in, in our particular case, additionally sound record the vocalizations of any animals that are present within that environment stroke habitat. How to achieve this uh, uh, this success we'll talk about um, later on, but that's what I define as field craft, the ability to get in somewhere without disturbing anything, make my recording and get out without disturbing anything. Now, uh, to do that, there's a big degree, it goes through a whole degree of field craft. Um, and um, the detail of which uh, I'll leave to a bit later, if I may. But does then, what do people feel about that? Do, 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 do you do you understand that? Do you think that's uh, a good thing to aim for? I think it's a really interesting definition, Roger, because um, I think a lot of people would initially think in terms of the quality of the recording that you get, that it's about getting a microphone really close to an animal or, or something like that. But you're talking more about the, uh, the experience for the animal rather than the recordist, I suppose. Well, I'm 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 thinking of one. I why 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 disturb anything? And the, also, what are the joys of getting to where you get to to be able to record? And there are many times where I get to places where I don't I don't record. I just want to sit and watch and listen to what's going on and learn about how things happen, the interface between things, because that will eventually leave, lead me to make a better recording in the future, because I, I will know how to deal with things in, in, in better in any location. So, um, yeah, I, I, I suppose you can anthropomorphize it. Why would I want to be disturbed when someone came around? Why, why disturb? Why disturb an animal? Uh, all you get is an alarm call, or it fly away, or run away. So that's no damn use at all. That you you've got a you've got a you lose the purpose for being there. Um, as for getting a microphone close to a subject, well, that's a whole new ball game. Um, uh, it's it's a quite a difficult, lengthy process that. Um, a lot of the time doesn't succeed. Sorry, uh, Jeremy, I'm just looking agreed that it's also very important to maintain the habitat. Isn't that? Well, yes, it, it, I, you know, the, the, you only leave your footprints or, you know, in, in the sand. Um, I, I, I really, I just love getting into places and getting out of places and I haven't disturbed anything and if I'm lucky enough to get a decent recording at the same time. And the same goes for photography. I'm a very keen wildlife photographer. 
and I, I can take a decent snap or two. Um, and you know, it, it's it, it's uh, although photography is so much easier than sound recording. Oh, gee, you know, oh dear, oh dear. Uh, I've, I've, oh, it's uh, I, I'd love to give a few so-called wildlife photographers the job of actually recording the subject they uh, they uh, they take the photograph on. Um, I'm going to break this up to to uh, to give you a. Uh, another, if I'm going to share, oh, ah, yes, Sue, you're absolutely right. Um, okay, I'm I'm going to go share again, and I'm just going to uh, show you a picture. I think. Uh -huh 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 -huh. I'll be there in a second, don't worry. I've got to look at my list here. Um, now that is an eider duck. It's an eider duck uh, sitting on a nest. Um, it's a very poor photograph. Um, it was done a long time ago, but it was, uh, it was one that I managed to get and it was sitting on uh, quite a few eggs and I will uh, I'll make that a bit smaller and I will then bring in this and and that's the sound of um, what goes on under that under that uh, under that either duck That's the sound of the chicks chipping away at the eggs, and, um, and every now and then the female will give a little bit of a grunt and say, you know, come on, do whatever. And uh, but sometimes you get this. I positioned the microphone, and he she snuggled up to it a bit closer, and that's the heartbeat of an eider duck. And it's, uh, yeah, well, well, it's not the most. Uh... So to get that recording and to answer Sue's question, in some extent, I, I, I had to do some work. I had to find where the, the eider ducks were for a start. Um, and uh, I went to, uh, I wanted to go on holiday. I always go on holiday to the Hebrides. Um, in fact, this year is the only second year in 50 years that I've missed going to the Scottish Hebrides. And I am quite pissed off about it, but it can't be all about everything. Um, the, uh, and I went to some islands called the Summer Isles. They're little islands off the, off the coast of uh, Scotland. And I then researched those and and uh, and found I did a lot of walking, a lot of looking through binoculars, you know, and found what I wanted to find. That was an eider duck's nest. Then I had the job of putting a microphone under the eider duck's nest. But at the same time as going around finding an eider duck, I found a herring gull's nest and an oyster catcher's nest. So I put a microphone under them as well. And one has to wait till they leave their nests and you smuggle a, a bit of a mic close to or around. And then you take a few hundred leads, hundred meters of lead back to a, a secluded spot behind a wall. And uh, you, uh, you uh, plug in and you sit there and wait and you enjoy what's going on all around you. And all of a sudden, you know, something happens and you press record on the uh, on the on the recorder. This is uh, I'll show you what that looks like, to be honest. Um, 
Pa, 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 pa. Okay. That's that was my that's where I sat. You can see the cables all coming back into a mixer into my lovely old Nagra E, which is a mono recorder, and I was switching from one one microphone to the other to record an oyster catcher and uh, and herring gold. Here's a herring gold. It's a quicker it's a quicker heartbeat. Than either, or well, not that much quicker. But the oyster catcher, they, they, they're a panic bird. They, they, oh, they're right on the edge. They, their heartbeat is, uh, is uh, quite, quite remarkable. Anyway, so while you're there, you've done your research, and that's an example of it. And you hopefully get some decent recordings. Right, Roger, just... can I just ask what you you said at the beginning that you intended to get the Ida Duck? That it was that sort of in your mind that you were looking to get that kind of recording, or how much of it was serendipitous? Well, no, I I, I did my research on the Summer Isles, and I knew there were Ida Duck breeding there, and I hadn't been um, on by that at that time onto to an island where the eider duck there was most most hebridean islands have eider duck breeding on them some more than others the summer isles is a very very small island and they have more eider duck per square mile uh, than 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 others so it was a focus i i thought oh, i was on a family holiday um uh, but one of the one of the things they knew my family was that I would have to spend some time sitting behind a wall, you know, uh, and um, and I've got recordings of my children listening into Ida Ducks and things like that, which I'm, I wonder now if they ever remember, but I'm sure they probably do. The, um, but no, I, Ida Duck was there in, on my, um, on my, uh, on my tick list, as was Snipe uh, and a few other things. And um, so, I got there never been there before but it's important that you have to spend time forget forget your recording gear you know just take your binoculars for a walk and quietly go about the place sit quietly and watch what's going on and then you can deal with whatever's there sometimes you find what you want uh, sometimes you fail to find what you want uh, but you probably find something else to do anyway so hey it's uh it's um it's uh, uh i i had a, quite a joy doing a i'm i don't know, I'm, i do do set i hate the word soundscape i do do habitat recordings um but uh the snipe were displaying and i haven't got a recording of snipe here but they were drumming all around me and that's one that was one time i really wish i had a stereo set up andrew um, because uh, it would have uh, it would have been a very lovely recording of uh, with my binaural head uh, with snipe just going round and round drumming. Um, it's I've never been anywhere else in the whole of the 50 years I've been doing 46 years I've been doing it where I've had that situation. You know I've I've been there where the snipe have been over there. But not when they've been going round and round around my head, which uh, you know, I wasn't even thinking about stereo at that time. But that was good. Well, it would have made a great recording. You, uh, it would, it would. So if you're ever anywhere near Snipe, um, uh, you know, um, um, you know, I, they're great. They really are. They, they, they. Once the once two or three of them are in the air together, it's quite fun. Sorry, what was that? Um, I'm just going to look at this chat. Sure. I've been asked by, uh, sorry, Veda Dormas. Uh, 
he asked for advice about dormouse. Well, dormouse, dormice, uh, they don't make a lot of sound. Um, they are more vocal at night. Um, and to be absolutely honest, I do something that I, 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 I criticise people from doing. Of course, they they just. Um, I would leave leave a microphone with a lot of uh, with a recorder. Sorry. I'm looking at this uh, chat where uh, uh, I name is Justina. Um, as wanting to know how to face with a problem rather than use the program to accelerate the process of listening records. One one record, ten hours. Well, you know, you. I'm sorry, I've been there. And um, in real to real terms, I used to have to listen to 25 minutes of after 25 minutes of real to real tape. Sometimes I had four or five hours of that. Um, but nowadays, if you put that on put that on your computer and you can see the waveform or uh, the spectrum analysis uh, on your screen, you know, you're, you should see the spike where that special sound is. And then really you could just scan through and just you know, put the 10 hours on and, 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 f and go through it quite quickly and pick that, uh, pick that shape. You get a shape on the screen and you get to know that shape and you should be able to pick things up quite quickly. That's what I would do, but maybe I, I haven't recorded dormice myself. So, well, I have, in, but in someone's hand uh, when they were doing research on it. Um, what sort of microphones in the nest? Yeah, well, uh, I actually use old dynamic microphones for that because they're you you usually can knock fence posts in with them they 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 um they 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 can suffer uh, being um wetted on and uh, and uh, and stuff and those recordings were made with would you believe a a record a microphone called a grampian dp6 which was the most um well it 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 it's uh, it took a lot of powering that uh, uh, that microphone, but when you've got it underneath the nest, well, you know, it doesn't need to be powered very much because you've got a you've got a lot of sound coming in. So yes, I would use a dynamic microphone, and nowadays I would use a cheap. Um, I use a, would use a cheap uh, Primo one seven two or two seven two as it is now, uh, because they don't cost a lot of money. And if something damages them, well, you haven't I haven't lost too much. I, I certainly wouldn't put my um, Sennheiser 8020s under the, the nest, although they would make a lovely recording. But uh, I'd hate to think what could happen to them if, uh, um, uh, you know, if, if it rained too much. I would cover them with some uh, waterproof material like cling film or something like that, just to take the worst away. But no, no. I I I'm, I I would use a, a Primo 172 capsule, and uh, and that's it. Uh, do you use hides or ghillie suits? Oh, my favourite subject, Vicky. <clears throat> oh, oh, do I laugh at people who are, uh, who walk around in ghillie suits? I I just find it quite amusing, especially. You better when explain they what a ghillie suit is, Roger. Well, a, a, a ghillie suit is well. <laughs> The stages of this uh, uh, stupidness, um, um, uh, and I'm sorry if I, you disagree with me, but I'm, you know, I, I always fall about laughing or try not to fall about laughing when I'm in a hide at an RSPB reserve, when people walk in with complete camouflage, camouflage gear on them, you know, they're, they're going to come into a hide and they think they're proper bird watchers because they've got the camouflage gear on. Now a ghillie suit is one up from that. It's like um, it, it's got um, it's it's it has netting all over it, camouflage netting, um, and uh, you've, you've got a hood and your hands are covered, so you you can blend in with nature 
presumably much much easier uh, uh, from my experience as long as you don't wear anything garish that has a lot of um, a contrast you know, between the top half and your bottom half and I your 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 I've, I've got a whole list here of things but um, uh, you know you uh, you 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 don't you don't need to have any particular special suit um, to uh, to uh, to walk around in nature and take photographs. Some people just love wearing them. Uh, you know, uh, that's up to them. I, I I don't know, but you know, I, I don't, presumably they like jumping out on people uh, because the thing that uh, the thing that animals find um, is that there's also your smell and uh, I'll talk about that in one of my tick lists at the bottom which is, which is great everybody's coming in but I'm, I'm I could I, I could say I could say quite easily I I don't wear camouflage clothing I wear clothing that doesn't rustle or rattle and uh, and I don't have things with velcro attachments because if I you know that the sound of velcro opening up if you wanted to get to a, a microphone or something inside your um, inside your um, uh, uh, coat you you velcro is a pain um, and also you you I, I tried it once I thought well I'll try smearing some animal excrement on me uh, to take away my my scent um, and I, I, I made a mistake really because I was going after deer and uh, the, I couldn't find any deer excrement so I, I actually found some sheep excrement and uh, you know so I smeared that over my trousers just to you know just to think well that'd be good uh, what I didn't realize at the time is um, deer don't like the smell of sheep so I was, I was, uh, you know, I was doing something worse, you know. I, I, I wasn't wearing aftershave or some, you know, anything like that. But I was actually um, creating a problem for them because they didn't like the smell of sheep. So no, I don't think you need. You, you've got to do simple things. Stay downwind of animals like that, <clears throat> and don't, don't wave your arms about, especially if you've got a bald head like mine. You know, uh, cover it up, cover up your hands. <clears throat> Don't have any white bits showing. Beards are good, ladies. Beards are good. You can, you know, if you, you know, false ones are great. You know, they do cover the face. Uh, I, you know, I haven't tried false ones myself. Um, I've asked by uh, back going back to, um, and that's quite true. Uh, this is Tony. <laughs> Uh, some of you know that Tony Bayliss is my best mate and uh, he's he's managed to get me to other parts of the world that I would never even dream of um, but yes I wear the same clothing and I was walking around my reserve uh, I, I look after reserve the other day and we have a nice lot of fallow deer in the moment and I wear the same thing and they've got used to what I wear and now I can walk around you know quietly slowly and they don't run away anymore because they know that that person they saw before is um is uh you know oh he's not going to bother me and uh, i can i can actually count the number of deer i can stop occasionally and look at a nice big buck and uh count the count the, the fawns and they don't run away so that's it the other question um Tony asked is how did I get the mic to the nest well I, I waited to the um, the uh, the birds weren't on the nest uh, and I had everything ready Tony um, uh, with lead you know long leads and everything and uh, I quickly I quickly put the mic uh, the eider duck I put it right in the lovely nest they have with eider down you can hide it quite easily on the um, on the oyster catcher nest, it's not so easy. It was put in the uh, put in the uh, 
um, the grass the next to it and underneath it I was quite lucky to get that heartbeat uh, so yes it's just a matter of doing it when they're not there and uh, and I find that once they're sitting on eggs they tend to be rather you know they they ignore other things so it's it's uh, it's uh, it's easy to do right um, I'm just is there any more so I do use hides uh, Vicky um, if I'm going to be there a long time they're great um, and I've got a recording that I would never have got uh, other than that it's not a it's not a great recording but it's in it's one I would have not got unless I was in a hide Yes, that was a, uh, some of you myself, that was a, a very excited um, pheasant. Um, and that's what their, fo their food beckoning call. Um, it was a cock pheasant. And I was actually fo photographing um, a, a bird called a jay, Garrulus garrulus. And, um, and I dropped a few peanuts about the place to uh, attract the bird. Uh, but I didn't realize it was going to attract a pheasant and um, it came round and it was walking around the uh, the hide luckily I had I, I had a little micro little recorder with me so I just switched it on and it it makes that call saying I found some food I found some food you know, I'm a clever chappy trying to attract other you know females to his uh, store of food so yeah um, um, uh, that's what uh, that's uh, that's how that happened but uh, because I was in the hide he didn't know I was there and so he was just quietly chunkering away um, to um, to uh, uh, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry it sent your dog crazy he probably likes chasing pheasants I don't know um, a, a, a pheasant sounds almost like a small dog well yeah well pheasants are you don't I mean those who know England we have a, a, a cultural pub problem like many countries that people like shooting things and uh, and you uh, and there are gamekeepers and uh, estates that um, you buy in <clears throat> thousands and thousands of young pheasants <clears throat> feed them up and then at a certain time later in the year, <clears throat> excuse me, about now, they let them out and invite a load of friends who pay huge amounts of money to come and shoot them. And uh, I, 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 I have to say I was one of those people once, but I'm afraid it's just, um, just as I just can't understand why people do it. Uh, I can understand clay pigeon shooting, but when you see how beautiful the feathers are and the pheasant and the different varieties I just don't know why you do it and they're not that great eating anyway if, <clears throat> well especially if you had to uh, scrape their lungs out of their bodies and innards out and before you can cook them and pluck them it seems a great deal of effort for, for, for not a lot of um, food anyway that's what a pheasant is it's a, it's a, a game bird and lots of them get shot at the moment, my reserve is surrounded by people um, shooting pheasants, and I always thought they were ignorant birds, but in fact, they are quite intelligent because I've got hundreds of them in my reserve, which is a bit of a pain actually because they eat everything, and the wild birds, um, you know, the, the wild birds don't get a look in sometimes. 
Uh, Follow Peregrine Force. Well, yes, you'll have to wait, Craig. I'll I'll, I'll save my um, my Madagascar recordings because that's one thing that Tony Tony Bayliss is a, a, a is a bit of a I don't know. If you go anywhere with Tony, you always have good fun, um, and he invited me to um, he invited me to Madagascar because uh, he was there for uh, nearly a year. So <clears throat> I risked life and limb. Um, you know, marriage and whatever, and I, I went out for a few weeks and I managed to do some recording out there. But that's great. And the Peregrine Falcon, well, I used to live in the Lake District um, for 40 years, and I, they were quite quite common with me. Uh, they were great fun to see. So <clears throat> I'm going to get on with and bring something to um. I've got a tick list here and I'm going to go through it. Please don't. Uh, we'll talk about it afterwards. Um, oh, no, you can you can come in any time, but I, I must get through it. There are 16 items. And it answers some of your questions. Um, how to how to gain field craft skills. And don't forget what I've said is that any wildlife sound recording was then any wildlife sound recorders should use some sort of field craft. Some will need to use more than others. Um, so, but what all of us should do is research and study the subject you want to record, learn its cause and song, so you, that you can recognize them orally as well as visually. You know, you, there's so much you can do these days on a computer. You can get, you get the sounds, you can get, you get pictures of them, but it doesn't, nothing, Nothing beats going, once you've done that, going to the area where you want to do the recording and, and you know, go for walks. I, I've got them here, so go on a few binocular visits. So just leave the record behind uh, and, and just go and look and, and, um, and learn about um, uh, where you're going to do it. When you're there, you can <coughs> you can you know hopefully find the subject you want, and you can learn how close you can get to it without causing any problems. You can find nooks and crannies where you can hide yourself to get the recording or the photograph, but to get the recording. I I I just uh, you know, I just dress sensibly, um, pretty nothing contrast. I cover up. I cover up my um, face and bald head and uh, white hands, and I can sit there for hours just, just you know, watching the world go by. And if my, if I've got my microphone in place, I can switch, I can switch the recorder on and, and record. Um, <coughs> when you're out there, I, I mean, I've been in Oz. And uh, I have to say, the flies are just as bad in Oz as they are in, in fact, they're worse in Oz than in England, except for the Scottish midge that gets in everywhere. Um, so insect repellent is quite good. Uh, uh, and mozzie nets, you know, you know, cover your face with, uh, it helps you know, take the whiteness off your face. Um, as I said, cover bald heads, beards are good. You know, uh, I used to have a beard. But that got it was okay when it was brown, but when it got white, it, you know, it's it lost its purpose really. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm just going to have a sip of coffee here, which has gone cold, by the way. Ah, better. But when you're in these um, in the place and you're really concentrating on getting a recording. You've got to learn to move slowly and, and thoughtfully and therefore quietly. You know, you, I would always look a few steps ahead. I don't want to tread on a, a stick and break it and make a noise. Um, you, you, I mean, our hobby is a solitary hobby. You know, trying to do it with another person is just, you know, deemed to be a failure. 
I mean, you just, you know, I have a, enough trouble with my own stomach rumbles, let alone someone else's. Um, so really, it's it's go quietly, you know, and, and there's the simple things like any of us who have been shooting or whatever, you, you never show yourself above a crest of the rise of ground and you have to learn to use natural cover. You know, I love crawling on my belly round things. It's just one of those things I do. Um, yeah. Um, always, if you're re recording mammals, always approach downwind. Uh, if you have to use a torch, um, use a red filter always uh, and minimize the time you're using. And I say that because a lot of the times when I've been out recording, uh, I've done the survey of the place and um, and I know where th where the birds are going to be, say, or the animals are going to be, but I I actually get there in the dark so I can secrete myself while it's dark and then I wait for the dawn to happen or the, the you know the 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 things to wake up and hopefully uh, perform what they were performing three or four days ago uh, when I saw them uh, and I, I'm, I'm there in position and ready to record. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, sorry, I'm just reading a thing from Tony. Yes, thanks for that, Tony. Um, but always have, you're going to be there for a long time. So, uh, you know, you, you've got to be warm, you've got to be, you've got to be cool or whatever you want to be. Uh, but, you know, you need some water and, you know, I, you know some sustenance, because sometimes, you know, I sit there for a long time. And uh, I always find uh, whiskey is very good in uh, uh, in uh, Scotland. It's a tradition. Uh, one one has to follow traditions, uh, and um, you know I, I I think it's a good tradition to follow. Um, if I'm in England, of course, I only use water uh, and, and and things like that because hey, you know. Uh, <coughs> particularly. If you're doing open microphone recording, I've got to get that microphone close to a subject, and it sometimes takes days to move the microphone close enough to the subject. Uh, and that microphone has to be camouflaged in some way. So I usually use all sorts of things, uh, scrim netting um, uh, and camouflage material. Uh, as natural as possible. Oh yeah, I'll just do, do something on that. Um, I'll do. There's a couple of photographs. I don't usually take photographs of what I, I've. Uh, so this is. Um, That's um, uh, that's a uh, my microphone uh, setup. Um, the scrim has come off the uh, the tripod, but I would usually have the scrim around the tripod, and that's a, a, um, a windshielding on my parabolic reflector that tries to blend in to to uh, the surroundings. Now I I wouldn't particularly use that that. Uh, windshield in in a wood I would probably use this one but you wouldn't use that windshield um, in the open because it stands out like a sore thumb doesn't it and uh, so uh, you you need to you need to think about your where you're going to do the recording where you're going to place your microphone and your um, your uh, your covering of that microphone, the windshielding, should, you know, should reflect, in my opinion, the environment it's being put in. Um, I'll get through this. For, yeah. Uh, so uh, getting that microphone 
into place. And as you can tell, I tend to use long leads. And long leads can be, it's surprising how long leads can put off animals. They can see this black snake or gray snake in the ground and uh, they don't like it. So you, you, you tend to have to try and camouflage the lead. I tend to do it by dropping it in a ditch or uh, taking it underwater or, or something and um, and uh, getting it back to where I was. Uh, it's uh, oh, and, and one of the things I learned by my mistakes is when you cover the disguise, the microphone, if you, you mustn't have anything flappy because the wind will catch it and will ruin your recording. It uh, really, uh, really, uh, uh, a really stupid thing to do because it's, uh, you know, you, you wasted a lot of effort and all you've got is a, a rather poor recording. Uh, and finally, two things. You should know how to use your recorder without even looking at it. You know, you, you, the same with goes with cameras. You should, you should not need to keep on looking at your recorder. You know, you need to, you need to be able to switch it on and off and alter it and adjust it without really need to look at it. Practice doing that. And the same goes for using your DAW, your door in the studio. You need to know how to use use that. I can't think of anything else. Um, uh, flappy means loose clothing or tape. Yes, Jeremy, that's what it does. You 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 need to you don't need it. You need to have a certain amount of air gap around your microphone, obviously, but you don't want anything flapping about. Arwin, what's this about scarlet honey heaters? Oh, Scarlet and Honey Eaters reminds um, that there's a picture of me. I just I know it, it, it's uh, it it's um, I'll uh, oh, right okay I'll escape from that. Oh come on. Oh. oh, we've got a seize up here. I don't quite know what's happened. Oh dear. Oh, well, I was going to show you something. I'll switch them off. Right, I'll um, uh, I'll show you that. Uh, I can I can make it come bigger. That's me smiling, which is, you know, quite a unique thing. Um, I don't know whether anybody recognizes it, but it was me at uh, India Head, Indian Head on Fraser Island. And I have to say, I am shocked and, and oh dear. Roger, <laughs> I mean, we're not getting that, uh, we're not getting that picture. I think you've dropped out of screen share again. Ah, right, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I'll drop. I'll go into screen share. Thank you. There we are. Are you getting it now? Yes. Yeah, great. So that's um, that's me on Indian Head on Fraser Island, which I put it in. I, I wasn't going to put it in because I'm not recording anything particular except the waves on the bottom of Indian Head. Uh, with my lightweight binaural setup, and all I was doing is really recording that and looking at the humpback, the whales out at sea, which was just a fantastic um, day. Um, I think Tony was off fishing somewhere around the corner. I don't quite know, but uh, the the actual shock I heard about um, the the fires on Fraser Island, uh, I I just oh, it's just so sad and i wow um what a what a shocking thing to happen uh, i think it's i hope they didn't it didn't get to the Sat saturnay forest um i don't know where anybody knows that but uh, uh i mean the most field craft i ever did on on fraser island 
was keeping out the way of 18 to 30 uh, people, um, you know, who were having a good old time. Uh, although I did, I had, I did enjoy a good splish splash on um, on the in Champagne Pools, which was quite fun to to, to do. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, that's that's that was. Um, uh, I wanted to say something about Fraser Island. So, um, Tim, uh, digital. I, I use Audition, uh, Tim, because I've always used. I started off with Cool Edit Pro, that was bought out by Adobe, and I don't spend my monthly. Uh, don't spend uh, my monthly uh, money on it. I've got the last one before you had to go into a monthly payment. And it does me fine, and I I like audition. Reaper haven't quite got the hang of it. It does it it does it in a different way, and I I'm I'm rather hooked into audition. Audacity is a free thing, and I I think it's really good, and you can get lots of things done. It it's um, algorithms are not as good as others for dealing with sound, but hey, you know you it's, it's free. What about floating down Ely Creek? Yeah, yeah, that was good fun as well, Tony. Thank you very much. Uh, I, the things I did, well, things we got up to, quite remarkable. Right, that's 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 really all I've got to say. I hope I haven't bored you. Um, please, uh, let's have some questions if you've got any more. Roger, I'm just thinking a little bit about birds and, and not so much um, non-passerines, but songbirds. Mm -hmm. uh, have, what's your what's your strategies for working with uh, with birds? And maybe you could uh, add in some comments about frogs and insects as well. Well, yeah, sure. Um, the main thing about recording any subject is to do your research on it. So, for instance, um, you know, learn about um, the, the the bird. Learn about what its normal habitat is. And if you can listen to other people's recordings, you get, you know, you obviously you can get um, knowledge of what it sounds like as well. And when, you've got to get that in your head, really. Uh, before you, uh, you've got to get it in your head if you're going to be su really successful at re recording it. Um, approaching, approaching a songbird, or, or, or uh, a bird, say a, a bird that sings from its song post, um, which is the easiest of the birds to do, rather than ones that sing when flying in the air. Um, you, you just, you need to do your research at the place where you want to record it. And you've done, you, you know, you know, you've found out where these things are, like me and the summer hours, uh, and you then see where it sings from. And it might sing from three or four different places, but you have to pick one of those four, uh, or you can, if you've got four microphones and four cables and, you know, things like that, you can, you can, you can, you can do four, um, but if you pick that one place, and you um, and you put your microphone there, and hopefully the bird will come back and sing like it sang on previous occasions, right in front of you, right in front of your microphone, and 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 that's that's how I go about recording individual. Uh, bird species uh, but obviously I have to be I haven't I've got to be in position where I'm not going to scare them away uh, so all that field craft bit needs to be done to get there um, when it comes to amphibians amphibians you they they yeah, well especially if you're doing hydrophone recordings of them um, you know, putting a putting a hydrophone in, in into water, uh, it will scare them. You know, they they they. You tend to have to put things like hydrophones into into ponds, 
and then and let them get used to it there and let them they usually start up again but any footfall in the ground they feel the footfall but if you approach them they, well, they usually stop immediately um uh and uh uh and uh you you can you can record now i am obviously i've said some comments about parabolic reflectors um i use parabolic reflectors a, a lot especially when i've been in uh, places i i knew to me uh, especially if i've been in um, you know rainforests and things like that uh, and i still use it it a lot but i have to realize the the uh, certain problems that parabolic reflectors have um, they're not very good on bass sounds and they can record different frequencies at different levels but you know it's just you know i'm, I'm I read up about parabolic reflectors you know just you know um uh, and you'll see you see what the problems are with them and don't forget i always wanted to try and get the most accurate recording i can and parabolic reflectors don't necessarily give me the most accurate recording um uh and uh they make great recordings i use you know but they don't give you the most accurate so if i was going for uh, recording something like I think uh, Jeff Rowe is saying he's got some lyre birds they're semi-tolerant to people he's one yeah well you know sorry Jeff I'd love to I have I haven't recorded lyre birds but um, I assure you that I would just be love to be there with my binaural head and um, 100 meters of cable and uh, I get a great recording of those, if they're, especially if they're semi-tolerant of people. Uh, but how do you get rid of the people? Uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, are you allowed to, you know, shoot them or get, you know, get Which... rid of them? You know, uh, I, you know, I, I, it's getting rid of people is the problem. Um, they're 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 just noisy beasts. They they just why why do why do some people have to go around a lovely nature reserve, sort of shouting and talking i mean i can understand that with kids but my god there's some very yeah i don't want to say it. anyway uh getting rid of people you know uh, i i don't quite um i haven't worked out how i can do that legally yet it's uh it's, it's just one of those things and yes tony yes shooting them is quite acceptable is that one of the things you can do in australia oh i didn't know that that oh that sounds very attractive um <laughs> uh do you make your own wind damping camouflage recommend to us i heard that the fur types can scare animals away oh yes um i you know, you know that black um i make my own windshield wheel shielding and you can make it out of anything i i i used to go to um you know the markets which we're not allowed to go to anywhere over the last year but uh, the the storeholder used to get a bit upset with me because I used to put it to my to my mouth and I used to blow through it and uh, you know if I could if I could feel it through the other side it was okay as long as you was less than what I was blowing in this side you can't you know you can't stop you don't want to stop air coming through therefore sound coming through but you want to sort of um, lessen it uh so yes i i go uh, i it doesn't have to be camouflage material i think what's this obsession of always having camouflage material i don't know um uh yeah so that's that um fur types yes um i'm um, that black fur i made the mistake of putting two microphones by a bird table in my garden and i had all sorts of bird birds on this bird table and I tell you one thing: one thing you to get rid of birds on your bird table is put two microphones with black fur uh, next to it. It, it. it scares all the birds away quite happily. It's um, it's uh, and of course they think it's an animal. Uh, as soon as I changed it to just a simple little, you know, 
a drab material and put them there, they all came back. So black fur is not a thing to use um, when you're too close to animals. So I, I would use a drab wind wind um, a baiting um, uh, material. And it, I, I, you can buy expensive stuff, but the biggest thing to aim for is that air gap between your capsule and the windshield. The basic rule is that there should be at least twice um, the diameter of your capsule each side and make a windshield that, that big. It, it, it works quite well. But hey, if it's blowing a gale, all you're going to get is a recording of a gale with a bird sort of, you know, tweeting or something, and uh, which can be quite fun to do. Uh, I have a little Tascam DR05. Would this get reasonable quality recordings? Uh, I don't know the DR05, uh, but modern modern it's uh, modern recording devices are are fantastic compared with what we used to have back in the old days. Uh, anybody should be able to get a decent recording, but you do have to get you know, a sensible distance uh, from the subject. And to do that without scaring things away, that's that's what field craft's all about. Um, you know, you can you can camouflage you can you can camouflage your recorder. Uh, I, it, it, I'm sure it will make great recordings. It will make reasonable quality recordings. It won't make the best quality recordings, but it will make some bloody good recordings. It really would. Sue Gold, microphones. Uh, that makes a difference. You're getting good. Microphones are like lenses. You know. You throw cameras away, but you don't throw a lens away. A really good lens is fantastic. A really good microphone will never let you down. Having said that, I've been using these EM27, well, 172s, and they are brilliant. But in a local, in a latest, um, uh, a Zoom meeting for the Wildlife Sound Recording Society. There was a comparison between paired Sherps microphones and a pair of uh, EM172s. Now, if you played the 172s by themselves, you think what a great recording that was. Now, the subject they recorded was quite a powerful subject. The test comes when you're recording a little small subject, when you've got to wind the gain up to get a decent recording. But when you've pl played those two things one after the other, the Sherps, just like, you know, I'm using the Sherps as an example, but they, it was just a lovely recording. It had warmth, it had the depth. It, it, was, it was a much nicer listening recording than the ear the uh, EM172s. Uh, but you can get a pair of EM172s, uh, or you can make them yourself for well under 100 quid. Uh, you get a pair of Sherps, like I've got in the shelf up behind me there, uh, you know, for a couple of thousand quid. Um, 100 quid to a couple of thousand quid, you know. It, a good microphone will all, always um, uh, see you well, but whether it's worth all that extra money, I don't know. I I do because I've spent my money now, so I'm, I've got to say that they're worth it. Uh, but uh, I use one seven twos all over the place. I stick them down holes, stick them up trees. Oh, I do all sorts of things with them, uh, which I wouldn't dream of doing with my Sherps or my Sennheisers. So that's that question there. I borrowed some. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you'll 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 enjoy them, uh, Arvin. You you really would. Andrew, tell us about Fred. Oh, oh. 
Um, I'm going to leave the screen at the moment and I will come and introduce you to Fred. This is Fred. Fred is made out of a polystyrene uh, ships uh, boy, not a boy, uh, you know, a, a fender thing, which I found on the beach on the island of Cole in the Hebrides. Now, I am not a great believer, and so what I do is stick microphones in here and there. As you can see, it's my way of doing binaural. I don't want to go into any discussions, deep discussions about, you know, how binaural microphones should be set up. The proof of the pudding is what they sound like. And Fred has made some really good recordings and I'm very pleased with them. But I've made it myself. It was white, obviously. It's, you know, it's, I put a nose on so I could knew, knew what was the front and what was the back. And, uh, and uh, you know, that's, uh, that's a homemade thing and it made very good recordings. You could put a pair of EM172s, um, obviously Omni mics for binaural recording uh, in there. And, uh, and it's, uh, but I can't carry this around the world. So what you saw in that other picture was my lightweight Fred which is really just a, a partition each side and I can actually put the mic shape the microphones wherever I want them. But that is Fred. Does that satisfy you Andrew? How would work Fred work in the field? Well I, I, I ask it nicely to, um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make good recordings first um, but what I do is I position it position it um, where I want to position it. It's camouflaged. I just wonder if I've got the picture of that. I can go, I think I can, I can share screen. Let me have a look first. Da, 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 da. <laughs> I thought I had a picture of it. Uh, excuse me. Ah, right. I will share screen, shall, and I will go down to and do that. That's Fred in the field. Uh, it's got a couple of, we probably had a couple of shirts, Mike, in, in there or uh, at that time. And uh, that was in Arctic, subarctic Norway, subarctic Sweden, and um, the mics had uh, the mics each side had their own um, uh, little windshields on them, but then I used the parabola, parab the parabola windshield, just to to go over the top to make a green lump, rather than you know, a lump. Uh, I've just taken the uh, scrim netting off the tripod, um, but I would normally have a scrim netting around the tripod. So that's that's what I would do there. Does that answer your question? I hope it does. Um, I will now, well, I'll just show you something else. This is this is lightweight Fred, and this is, I wouldn't usually have it exposed like this. I would usually have um, some cloth over the whole thing, but I'm using ball gags, um, Ryko ball gags for the microphones. And it's something that I've been experimenting on over the last five or six years. And that's uh, trying to emulate the Decca tree setup uh, on recording. Um, where I've got a central microphone as well as two mics on the side. Uh, this means 
if you if you are on a binaural recording, if you if you widen the microphones out too much, you have a hole in the middle. You can get a hole in the middle. You you seem to when birds fly past, they don't. There's something happens. Something happens to the sound in the middle. So what I uh, so what I done there, and this is what Decker trees do. I put I could put a mic in the middle, and that fills the gap. I can have a very wide wide stereo, and uh, and I I've got something to fill the middle. That can also be used to highlight. I can put a a big wide field in, but if I've got a specific subject in the middle, I can pinpoint that subject. And what I would do then, instead of using an omni in the middle, I would use a cardioid or a hypercardioid in the middle, and I would mix them in the field. Um, I will have my mixer, uh, and I would mix them in the field, and then go into the recorder. So that is my tri head exposed. Um, um, when you you, I would, I could use that. For instance, it, I did use it. In, in that form when I'm doing estuary recordings with um, with geese flying over uh, it, it, it just it just seemed to it seemed to make make the the front a bit more solid than than uh, and, it, and, and better to listen to anyway that, that's 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 that um, right okay um, I've asked you what best mobile phone app to record, but I can't answer that question, Craig. I would never dream of doing it. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, I am. I am. I do get a bit upset with people that say, "Well, you don't need in all these super recorders." I do it on my smartphone, and I go jolly good. Carry on, um, and uh, and whatever, whatever, whatever suits. But uh, people who think they can get the best recording in the world on the smartphone, I'm sorry, they're kidding themselves. They are great things to have. Great, I have one all the time, you know. And when I'm carrying it around, something happens. I can take a picture with it. I can record with it. Um, but I wouldn't say it's the best. Uh, you can disagree. I'm quite happy with what I think. So uh, that's that, really. Right, Andrew, uh, really, I don't know. Uh, is there any other questions? Uh, yeah, I'll throw anything? another one in there. And um, and Sue's saying we'd like to hear some of your recordings. Oh, uh, recording. Well, what would you like to hear, Sue? I'm sorry they're mono. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do is um, I'll just I'll, uh, I'll screen and play a few and then I'll come out and then you can have a chat about them um, afterwards. Uh, right, OK, I'll, uh, I'll share screen. OK, come out of that. Just just while you're looking for um, <clears throat> some recordings, Roger, Andrew also just asked whether you ever use insect repellent on your gear. I, I recently used some um, Bushman's repellent on some of my gear and uh, uh, was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't. Um, <laughs> you have to be very careful. Uh, it, it tends to melt plastic quite easily and do all sorts of things. I found that when I was in uh, Scandinavia, for, I was in the Arctic first time and I needed a lot of uh, insect repellent and I, I'm afraid it did get at um, get at, at some of my uh, my camera stuff. Uh, and uh, luckily, using long leads uh, and a Naga recorder, which is usually metal, um, I, I obviously it didn't get on my um, on my microphones, and it didn't seem to affect the the metal of the Naga. But if you, I, I believe certain types of plastic can be affected by certain types of insect repellent so you do have to be rather careful there um right so i'm uh, i'm i'm uh, 
there's some there's some recordings you do you know i i'm i'm going to mention my book now i should mention my book or so the book the only book you need to buy it's um and it's on the front cover it's got a picture of uh, an otter uh, otters are really really difficult to record you have to do a lot of field craft they're bloody things to keep on moving you know and they swim and you know uh, and you know how jeez they are difficult but you can get a couple of photographs which i was quite pleased with with that that i spent a lot of time getting that photograph in devon um with uh, with uh, on the, which is on the front oh, i better better show it now where is it oh dear yeah There we are. That's um, I showed. That that's a that's a, a recording. Uh, that's a photograph I I took of it growling as a, a growling at another otter. Um, but it's uh, but my favourite photograph uh, of the otter is this one. Uh, it knows I'm there. I've been there for a long time. It knows I'm there. And it's just, what's it thinking? What, you know, you know, you no, know, is it, you know, I just, I just don't know what it's thinking. It's a, I, I love that photograph. It's uh, it, I, I was looking straight at it through my um, mozzie net sits completely silent completely not moving and i've been like that for the previous hour or so and it just came up a little bit closer and looked at me and oh I'm, i've got tingles it tingles in my body now it and, and that's what happens when you, you you get field craft you get to places like that and things like that happen and i've you know oh, um, you know, it's it's just it's just it's just wonderful. It really, really is wonderful. Um, but you think, well, you know, wouldn't it be nice to, you know, to? Um, well, I bet they make a lovely sound. Well, this is what the otters sound like. Not not the duck. Little zeep, zeep, zeep. That was recorded with a with a parabolic reflector. The animal was only about forty foot away from me, and that, and that's what you get. It's just this little contact call. If you're lucky enough to find some young otters, and, and they're mucking about you get a bit more And, and really, that's the best I've got of, uh, of otters. They were, um, I, I, there was an occasion, and well, would I have loved to have a camera or a recorder with me? I was on the Isle of Mull with a great friend of mine, um, Simon Elliott. You may have heard of him. These are absolutely tremendous wildlife sound recorders one of the best uh, better than me and uh, we we're on mole together and it was the time where they were reintroducing the sea eagle and um, we we're at a place where 
he had helped with the sea eagle and he had been told that the the, the sea eagle wasn't nesting there that year so he felt it safe to take me to that place i was very honored and it was a sunday it was drizzling but it, we were going to see where a sea eagle nested and we 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 were walking up this uh, little valley and there was a little lochan in the valley and binoculars just had binoculars and um, Below me, there was a pair of otters eeling in this um, in this lochan. Now, eeling is where they dive underwater looking for eels, and all you see is their tails waving about in the in the uh, in above the water. Their the whole of their bodies in the water, and you've just got their tails just waving about. So we stopped dead, went down on the ground and started to work out how to get closer to these otters. And the idea was, once they'd both gone underwater, we would go there and then stop. And then once we looked at them again, we would go there and then stop. And we, we, we're we good at this kind of thing. Uh, Simon's probably better than me. He's smaller than me. He can get into little nooks and crannies better than me. Um, and we did this and after about four moves, we got to within about 20 or 30 feet. And the otters came up with a with a, an eel. And honestly, I could hear them oh, 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 and a bit squeaks and think, oh, wonderful recording. Right, we sat and watched them for I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. And then we said, right, okay, we've got to get out without disturbing them. So we did the reverse of what we did and we got to there and we thought oh great we stood up and all of a sudden this thing went over our heads within about 10 foot of us there's a bloody great sea eagle and it just 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 it was only 10 to 15 foot above us it has swooped down the people who are supposed to watching this nest who said no no it's not breeding in that nest any this year need shooting because it was and i've never got out of an area so quick in all my life because you know i didn't want to disturb the, uh, the 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 sea eagle the white-tailed eagle but what a day that was watching otters otters eeling hearing them chewing you're not having a bloody recorder or microphone and not even having a camera so you know those are the days you remember aren't they uh let's play in a few more sounds um uh i'll, I'll play that one Well, that was uh, recorded in the Sweden Subarctic, and what you heard was 
the main bird singing there was uh, Redwing. And the tapping you heard was uh, Black Woodpecker. And the kind of warbling deep sound were Black Grouse. And uh, uh, I, I pity you can't hear it in stereo. I don't know why. I must, we must sort that out, Andrew. I don't quite know why that's happening. But the, uh, yeah, it was done with a binaural head. And uh, uh, what a wonderful morning that was. That was, uh, I've got hours of it. Um, and it's just superb. Um, but, but the fun thing there was, I recorded that. So that was great. But I thought I must try and get these uh, black grouse a bit better. You know, I, 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 just a closer recording, just a black grouse. Um, and so I went off the next day, very quietly walking through this area, a place called Grubzwicken. And uh, it was lovely. And yeah, they were there. I heard them. They were getting louder. And I couldn't see them. I would just, I stopped and I just, come on, Roger, where the, use your eyes, you damn fool. What, where are they? Binoculars trying to find them. I, I was just with binoculars. I wasn't doing recording. Just trying to find them. And uh, eventually I lay back on the moss because I hadn't slept that well that night. I never sleep when I'm recording. It's, uh, you know, I just fall asleep whenever I fall asleep. Um, and there was these 70 foot pine trees. OK. Big tall pine trees. And I lay back and I just opened my eyes and there on the tops of these 70 foot pine trees were black grouse. Now black grouse form a lek on the ground. That was all the knowledge I had. I should have read a bit more uh, because black grouse do all sorts of things. And you know when a, a pine tree gets very, very um, slim towards the top, you know, it, and the black grouse is a heavy bird. They were landing on this top of the pine and the, and the top of the pine was bending over near enough to 90 degrees. And they were calling from the top of these pine trees. I just lay there and just uh, amazement. Just, well, oh, what a morning, oh, fantastic. By the way, moss is a great thing to lay on. It's nice and comfortable. It's like eider down. It really is nice to lay on. I spent um, I, I spent a lot of time <laughs> lying down, uh, you know, covered in um, um, mosquitoes, uh, listening to things. Um, it wasn't too bad that morning, but yeah, yeah, wonderful. Black. Yeah. So um, enough. Um, Peregrine Falcon. Yes, that was recorded where I used to live um, in Annadale in Cumbria. Uh, I had a couple of pairs in the valley and um, I uh, used to, we did, used to, at the time, peregrines were, were persecuted and so uh, we were doing a, a protection thing on them. Uh, but while I was there, um, I thought I'd point a microphone at them. That was done with a gun mic. Uh, single gun mic and 816 and uh, that was the the, um, the female charging around um, just having a I, I haven't the faintest idea why it was making that it was just seemed a bit annoyed to me but I'd been sitting there for at least an hour and a half and you know it must have been uh, uh, you know upset about something but it, it, it went Again, when you get to know, get to know a place, all the 
strange things happen, different things happen. Uh, I was, it wasn't on that occasion when I recorded, I was there doing the peregrines and I'd made myself a little bit of a hide out of uh, uh, tree brashings and I had my back against an old uh, a larch uh, and I had um, some uh, uh, tree brashings. Their brashings are small branches uh, which have been chopped off the low down and I dragged them around to just just to give myself a bit of a hide you know a bit of a screen and I was sitting there you know or, or lots of layers on you know waterproof trousers up again my back against the the, the the tree big old tree lead out gun microphone about 50 meters away you know headphones on ready to switch switch on the recorder um, and all of a sudden, about oh, 30 foot away, this fox appears. And it walks towards me. And it got to within about 15 foot of me. And just stood there, just like the, the otter is now, and looked at me. As if to say, what the hell are you doing there? And he just, we just stared at each other for about... I know, 30 seconds, and it just went, mm, shrugged its shoulders, it seemed to me, and just walked on. Now, you know, again, if you don't get out there, you don't, you don't experience things like that, and some of you probably don't want to experience things like that, but I tell you, I do, it's the most, uh, the most fantastic thing. But if you are out there with your back against a tree, and I assure you, you need to be your back against the tree and preferably a tree further away from these these things. That's a red deer and that was recorded in the red deer rut time which is late September to early November and it was done in Scotland and um, you don't want to be standing out in the open with those they once they've got the the sex lust in them uh, they 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 don't you know you are nothing <laughs> you are nothing and and uh, and they have, they have quite, uh, quite. Uh, uh, where are we? Oh yeah, we'll have a look at this. They're quite big beasties. Um, and there he is chewing a bit of moss. But I assure you, those things um, can do damage, uh, and they try to do damage to each other. And it, if you're a, you know, a rather soft bodied um, a person in the way of them you know get themselves really excited you don't want to be in the way of those that's uh, that's uh, <laughs> no they're they're great lovely uh, um, hair on the back of your neck standing up you know I think we must come to an end really haven't we um, you know I, I'm, am I boring people I'm uh, I'm, uh, I'm sorry if I am. Um, I've uh, someone mentioned uh, Madagascar, and I haven't got a picture in Madagascar. I I, had, I didn't have a camera, but I only had a little camera with me there. But uh, this is for Tony, who really Tony. If it wasn't for Tony Bayliss, I wouldn't have got anywhere. Uh, in, uh, around the world, I'm, I'm I'm a great anglophile, but he said, "Ah, oh, come on, Rog, I'm in Madagascar. You know, 
yeah, come on, what's a, what's a marriage? You come out and join me. So I, I came out and joined him. And um, and on a, on a, I just, Zendri, uh, the biggest of the lemurs, um, uh, and I've forgotten the Madagascan name for the place, Tony will put it on the screen. Uh, the French name for it was Perenne. Um, and when they wake up in the morning, these family groups um, do their sort of morning calls, and you get the sound of other family groups further into the forest, you know. Um, coming in and calling and it's just unbelievably wonderful and uh, I was lucky enough to have a microphone there and uh, and recorded it and it's obviously my most spectacular recording I've ever done um, it didn't take a lot of recording didn't require a lot of field work field craft I, I just you know Tony had done all that. We're going to Perinay, the Zindri, and uh, we just walked down a, a path a couple of times, worked out where they were, and went back and recorded them uh, and sat under their tree. Um, you know, no, no, I, I don't consider that field craft. That's just straightforward, you know, going about business. But yeah, that's, um, that's, uh, that's what they're all about. Wonderful, wonderful. Right, unless anybody's got any more questions, I'm going to say I need another cup of coffee. It is 9.17 in the morning. <laughs> Tony's Sorry. got a request that you quickly play your caper Kaylee, and I want to hear your puffins because I think they're the most endearing creatures. Oh, right, okay. My cup of cat. well, I'll do caper Kaylee first, and then we'll do puffins. Well, um, I was doing some sound for a film uh, for Granada, not Granada, for Anglia. And uh, uh, Hugh Miles was the uh, um, cameraman. Uh, so I had to uh, place my microphones um, out of shot, as it were. And I hadn't worked with Hugh before. And he arrived after I'd set my microphones up. I, I knew where he was filming from. I knew where his hide was. Uh, and uh, I put my microphones out. And I introduced myself. And he said, oh, are you going to put your microphones out? And I said, well, I've already done it. And he, he looked at me and went, oh, 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 you know, oh, oh. Um, and uh, I said, I'm sure you can't see them, uh, Hugh. Oh, I don't know. I have to, you know, I'm so he went into his hide, put the big lens on the camera and looked out and said, oh, I can see it. It's there. 
And I said, no, that's not a microphone. Uh, I'll show you where my microphones were. And I, I, I showed him where they were and he was, we, we got on very well after that because I hadn't buggered up his, sorry, mucked up his, um, his shot. And that recording you uh, heard was um, of a Capricale display uh, doing a flutter jump. And if you were, if it was a proper WAV rather than MP3, uh, the act of Capricale, you've probably heard some noise. It, it was it, it was going walked past my microphone shield, and those were his feathers going across you know the the windshield, and he and he 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 made some of his sounds right next to the microphone. And you can you can actually see the sound disappearing into um, infrasound. You can see the you know the the different frequencies. They just go down in lines and disappear below twenty. Um, and and you know I presume that that sound carries um, or shows what a, 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 a he's the best uh, cock bird there. And uh, yeah, it was uh, it was quite. And you can hear other cocks about the place. The hens saw sitting trees going. I don't know about you. I don't know whether I like him or not. Or you know, do, doing the usual. You know, shouldn't anthropomorphize like that. But they just watch what's going on, and 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 choose whoever they want to choose. As usual, women rule the world. Uh, uh, I wish I'd known that a few decades earlier than I did, but uh, I, you know, I didn't. Um, I haven't got a picture of a Capricale because I was there recording. Um, I was there uh, sleeping inside my Land Rover for a week. Uh, and after sleeping inside a Land Rover for a week, you know, uh, you do really want to go and sleep somewhere else. It's, um, it's, uh, it was great fun while it is. But while I was there, um, in fact, it was a Range Rover rather than a Land Rover. I, I'd set my using it as a hide, all the leads were coming back to the car. I put a blanket across the windows and I was sitting with my back against the blanket, looking to where all my microphones were. And then uh, it was, um, they start up about four, five o'clock in the morning. So, you know, everything was up there in the dark. Hugh had arrived about two or three in the morning in his, uh, in his Volvo, we just had a quick grunt at each other because we were that's that time of the morning. You saw you can do. Uh, he'd gone to his hide and set himself up, and I, I, we, we waited for things to happen. And there I was, and all of a sudden I had this feeling that something was looking at me. And I'd parked my uh, the car, the Range Rover, uh, across across an old track. Okay. An old track and I got there and I thought what well, there's something I don't I feel I feel I'm un, I'm unhappy I'm unsettled and I, I, I this was a Whitney blanket it's a blanket with little holes in it and I looked I looked behind you know, tw twisted my head around to see and there was a capacale in the middle of the track about 20 foot away big capacale is a big turkeys they're big turkeys okay um and uh it just there looking at this this thing that was in its way this is where i normally walk and now this thing has been put across it i just froze i thought oh god i'm gonna i've ruined hugh's filming of you ruined my sound recording oh dear oh dear oh dear um, anyway, I just sat there and time went on and it must have been three, four, five minutes when all of a sudden the Kappa Kelly arrived in the, on the other side of the Range Rover and it had come up, walked around the Range Rover and then gone down the track as if to say, oh, you know, it's not doing anything. It hasn't, it hasn't shouted at me or you know made a noise and it's just gone past it and and it just carried on walking to its display area 
about about oh, about 700 yards away. Uh, but I had this. You know, it was looking at me through the, you know, what what, what the hell is, is that thing there? Anyway, Capercaillie puffins. Um, puffins nest in burrows uh, and so to record puppies like that you stick a microphone down a burrow um, they completely ignore it because they're they're coming back to feed their young or swap swap uh, positions on the nest and that banging you heard was them rubbing against my microphone or treading all over it um, and uh, they they are very endearing, aren't they? They they are very endearing. I should show. I don't know whether people know what puffins look like, but I have got a reasonably decent picture of a puffin. Um, that's that's a puffin, um, and um, yeah, again uh, recorded uh, um, on. Um, on the Summer Isles, and um, it was probably a DP6 down a hole, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's that's what uh, that's what uh, that is. Thank you. Uh, Let's do one last question and then we might finish off. And thank you. Uh, I think it was Sue asked, I'm just looking for it. Um, how do you um, how do you point a parabolic reflector accurately any tricks there um no um there's no tricks at all really you use your ears so um uh you uh, I, and hand holding a parabolic reflector without making uh handling noises is a skill um i think after about five or six years of doing it i was uh, quite good at it but what you do is you what you make sure is your para, your microphone is and I, I, probably if you've got a Telinga or a Wildtronics uh, mic uh, you that's already done for you but I have my own homemade um, uh, homemade uh, uh, it wasn't me who made it but it's a homemade uh, parabolic reflector and I make sure that my microphone is positioned absolutely at the focal point. So you've got to get that first. Um, Tillinger do it for you, but then you, then all you do is very slowly move the parabolic reflector left and right, up and down, and listen to it. And when it's absolutely right, that's where you you record. Uh, to get it a bit to the right or a bit to the left, you'll you'll get distortion or can get distortion. So really, I use my ears. I don't look at the recorder. I use my ears. And once I've I've got a, the best signal, I then switch on the recorder. 
I may switch on the recorder and then get the best signal afterwards because you, you know whatever we get a recording first <laughs> and get a better recording later. Um, but yeah, so that's use using my ears. headphones. Using use headphones. Oh, sorry. Yes, I always use headphones. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, um, my apologies. And, and that's, yeah, so that's the same with any microphone setup. You you use headphones. You know, it's it's use headphones. Yeah, and that question yeah. I think came from David Seckham. Um, rather than Sue, my apologies. Oh, right. Well, no, I, I, I always use headphones. Um, and uh, the amount of time, no, there's not a lot of times. You know, you, you should, or I should say, you should have a tick list. So when you, you know, go out, you've got, you've got all your gear with you. Uh, as, as people who know me know that I don't believe in tick lists. I, 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 I say I've got a brain. The trouble is that brain sometimes forgets to take the bloody headphones and I'm I'm stuck there just um, uh, uh, having to use, you know, looking at a metering on the machine uh, or, or hope for hoping for the best. Yeah, but headphones and a decent set of comfortable headphones is, um, you know, um, absolutely that and I'm not I, I can I can say what I use, but you know, try a few people. That's why you should, those people who haven't been to meetings, uh, you know, like I had at um, Lady Ellis Island, or was it Gundabuka? Gundabuka, Gundabuka uh, yeah. Mm. You know, you could, you can, you can try these things out. Uh, we have a, a yearly spring meeting for the Wildlife Sound Recording Society, and everybody's got all different gear. And, you know, can I borrow your you know, headphones, see what they sound like compared with mine, kind of borrow your machine, can, and everybody's, let, let's see what your microphone sounds like. And, and, and you know, you learn from that. And um, you, hey, if you have, if people who haven't been to these meetings, get to them and ask questions. <coughs> persuade Andrew to let him borrow his SAS gear, you know, persuade Sue to you know, see Tony to let you know his his um, his Sennheiser stuff. You know, um, you know, use them and you'll learn a lot. So um, uh, they're they're great. I wish I hope I may be able to get to another one in the future. But you know, I'm not we earning money anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you do yeah. too, Roger. Yeah. Would you like to say a, a little bit about your book and where it's available and and so on? Oh, yeah. I know, you I, mean, I know you mentioned it earlier. Well, I, that's about all I wanted to say, really. Um, uh, I don't know what, if anybody has read the book, I'm, um, it's not really for um, experienced wildlife sound recordists. It was written to try and encourage, uh, written to help people who show an interest in wildlife sound recording uh, and answer a few a few facts about it. It's available on Amazon at an extortionately low price. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm very proud of it. Uh, I, I've had uh, people tend to think it's a, a reasonably decent, but it, it's really for those people who are just showing an interest in wildlife sound recording. I don't go around saying you must have this or you must have that. It's I, what I say is go to join the Australian Wildlife Sound Recording Group or the Wildlife Sound Recording Group in England and go to meetings and learn and um, and and ask questions. And yeah, and, and thank you very much for putting in a, a plug for the AWSRG too, as well as the WSRG. Well, I, 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 it's, in, it's in the book. Uh, no. I'm, I'm very yeah. I'm very proud of being. I mean, I'm very proud of being a member of it. Um, they, 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 they are different to the Wildlife Sound Recording Group. They look at things in a different way. Uh, probably a bit more open uh, to uh, different ways of using wildlife, uh, wildlife sound. Um, uh, um, but you know, they, they're a good group, so you should join. Uh, and. Um, <laughs> 
and also join the Wildlife Sound Recording Society because that, that, I've only been a member there since 1974. That's another 46 years. God, I'm getting old. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's uh, good. Uh, one of the things that I was introduced to it, uh, and and Stephen Shepherd, who's my co-author, he knows all about books, and he said to me, he said, Rog, what are we going to do? And this is all done. He lives in America, in Vermont, in America. And so it's all done Skyping or Zooming uh, over the last year or so, uh, year and a half. Uh, he said, we're going to put these QR codes in. And of course, I go, yeah, OK, Steve, uh, Q Q QR codes. What, what, you know, explain QR codes. You know, um, I, and so there's this whole added thing on the book, the QR codes where you get links to some sound recordings, links to me, well, me talking, links to a video, links to whatever. It's a whole sort of added thing to 200 pages of book. Um, I th I th I'm, I th I'm dead chuffed with that. I think that's really good. But what did you think of it, Andrew? Um, look, I thought uh, that it was very comprehensive and um, I think it's a really difficult subject to, to tackle from a, almost a standing start. Uh, it's personally written. There's a lot of information, particularly about sound and how various gear works. Um, I'm really glad that we've had this session tonight for you to talk about fieldcraft because I was a little bit disappointed that that was the, the shortest chapter in the book. Um, but again, it, you know, it's fieldcraft, I think, is something that you come to once you've perhaps made a, a couple of forays and realised, oh, there's a little bit more to this than just taking a recorder out into the field and pointing it at something. <laughs> there's a bit more to be learned. So maybe that's the second book for you. And um, um, But, yeah, no, look, I, I thought it's a, a great book for its intended purpose. Um, I've got a, a copy, I've got a digital copy uh uh, on a well I, I've actually got a Kindle app on my phone and one of the problems with QR codes is you can't point your own phone at your own phone to read them so I'm glad that you've got them as a, a list of audio on SoundCloud that people can go to with links to that yeah that, th thank you for mentioning that because I forgot that there is a Kindle version you know uh, uh, there which is even ridiculously cheaper um, uh, uh, I, I'm you know with, Stephen and I aren't going to make a lot of money out of the book, but it's like all things, like when I did my CDs, when I asked to do things for films, um, it's a project and I, it's just, just great completing a project. Um, uh, like um, what we've done today. So I'm, I'm a little, I shall stop sharing now and come back to my big thing. All oh, right. All right. Well, um, I think we might wind up now. Uh, Roger, you have the honour of occupying our attention for the longest period of time that um, any of our guest speakers to date have, uh, for uh, which I'm I'm really grateful. And I I, I knew that you would have um, some fascinating things to talk to us about. So thank you so much for getting up early and firing up the coffee pot and um, and talking to us. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. Well, I'm, I have enjoyed it. I'm sorry I've been so verbose, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> and, and, and kept you all away from your uh, evening um, drop of uh, wine. Uh, you haven't kept I Tony eat. away from it. I've been noticing. Oh, no, no, no. no sorry, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't it, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly won't have kept him away from it. My good, is he drinking out of the bottle still? <laughs> I think yeah. he's become a bit more cultured now that he's living in this think, country, Roger. Well, he's, I, I don't know whether you know, he's been fighting wildfires on Mount, um, uh, on, uh, on, next to him for the last month. So he's been, he's been having a bit of bowel quake every now and then. He deserves a glass of wine or two. So it's been quite horrendous up there. But, yeah. um, he told me, uh, he sent me an email a few days ago uh, saying they'd had some rain. So hopefully that has quenched the fire. Yeah. Right. Yes, I've enjoyed it. I hope you've all enjoyed right. it. Um, uh, and uh, thank you. Um,
enjoy your sound recording. Um, there's, there's so much, just get out there. And, and oh, it's just wonderful. It really is. Well, Roger, we look forward to your second book that is really all about what you've spoken about this evening. I think that... Um, no. I'd like to encourage... To... We're trying to do something for children, actually, at the moment. And uh, because, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I do feel we need to get the younger generation, and I mean the very young generation, interested in nature and in particularly the sounds they make, which will probably help in the future making sensible decisions when we have to protect things. But uh, I don't think enough is done with um, younger children and, 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 and just, and, and we're trying to get, trying to get them, make it fun to do. I mean, that's the thing I haven't mentioned. You know, it's great fun. It's really good fun, you know? Yeah, you get wet, you get cold. My bum has been very cold at times. But, you know, you see things and hear things just because you've got out there. It's really, really good fun. <laughs> End of lecture. And you feed the mosquitoes in, at the same time. Well, yes, I, I have got a picture of me being bitten by a mosquito, but uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> I didn't know, realize I had that much blood in my body. Uh, yeah. yeah. Shall I leave the meeting um, and, no, and say goodbye? Well, let's. Um, I think um, if everyone's happy to to finish off, if anybody wants to, I'll I'll leave the meeting running just for a minute or two. If anybody wants a sort of social chat sometimes a nice thing to do but we'll actually wind up at this point and i'll turn the recording off and um, so once again roger thank you so much for your time and, and just sharing so openly your expertise because some people are a bit precious about their knowledge and um you're not and thank you for your passion well i'm, I'm not telling you where i go recording uh, i mean you know the hebrides is as close as you're going to get you know australia <laughs> I might go and say Queensland because that's all I've <laughs> been to. You know, Madagascar is good. Well, it was good in 1990. Uh, I don't know what it's like now, but you know, hey, uh, more detail than that, you'll find out for yourself. Yeah. All right. I'll pause the finish the recording now. Thank you all very much for joining us. Um, in a month's time, I haven't quite finalized the arrangements for this yet but uh, Virginia Hilliard and James Harris both of whom were at uh, Smith's Lake with us last year are going to give us an introduction to sound editors uh, just basic sound editors I think they're going to do Reaper and Audacity so giving you an introduction to that software and um, I'll chat with them further I might do a little bit on isotope as well so we'll do that in January sometime, possibly late January. Um, so uh, once again, I'll, I'll, I'll get that wrangled and I'll tell you all about it. I'll send out some emails. So thank you all very much. And uh, I'll switch the recording off now. And you're welcome to stay on for a few minutes. <laughs>